Thank you. Everybody can see my, did everyone receive this worksheet? Yeah, you sent in the uh, email. Okay. Yeah, I sent this an email. And so today is a light day. I am looking forward to the holiday weekend as well. We're going to end early. Uh, we're going to review the essentials that you need to know for the assessment. We're going to review each item on the worksheet quickly. And we'll uh, take a moment to articulate expectations about how the assessments work and what their, what their purpose is, okay? So you'll notice that this is a very highly structured worksheet, yes? And uh, one thing that you'll notice about this highly structured worksheet is the series of prompted sequenced questions. And one thing I want to call out intentionally is that if you're given a binary value or a hex value, um, essentially binary values are the common denominator or common link. They're the means by which you quickly and manually determine the value of a of a given uh, data point. So what am I saying? You can have decimal based information or you can have hexadecimal based information. And in order to be able to convert between the two manually, the key is to understand the binary equivalents. Now in your study guide addendum, we filled out the rest of the table and we posted a revision to the study guide addendum, which differs slightly from what we covered in our last class. Has everyone seen this or is everyone now aware of, of uh, what we're, what I'm talking about? So at the end, instead of showing an error, right? So what was the point we covered in last class? We have a tendency to think in double decimal terms when we get past the number nine. That's a habit, right? It's a habit. And as we're working in the wonderful world of digital components, we have to change the way we think. A good example is how we number the very first hardware component in any system. We always use the number zero instead of one, right? I showed you a column and then I asked what was wrong with this table. And a student in the class correctly pointed out that, okay, it's not, we're supposed to have the letter A there instead if it's hexadecimal. But I wanted to show you uh, either number uh, series on either side of the binary. And I also wanted to call out this pattern. So I, this is gonna be a helpful pattern for you to know intuitively in the same manner that powers of two if you don't, if you haven't committed powers of two to memory where, and, and when I see you in person on St. Thomas, not this, not today, but next Friday, I'm gonna sit down with you in a glass booth in the library or in a classroom in CA building, whichever one is more convenient. And um, one of the things I'm gonna ask you to do is recite, I'm gonna ask to see your hardware. I'm gonna ask to recite uh, to recite the powers of two. And that may seem like a goofy thing, but it's a little bit like boot camp, right? It's a little bit like boot camp. And the reason for doing that is I'm stressing these things and I'm going over and over some points because of the different manner of thinking about it. And the things that I tell, I'm not a very pushy person. I like to be agreeable, but the things I insist on, I absolutely insist on. You should be able to go from two, four, eight, right? We grow up learning the powers of two in our math tables and it's like two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. No, 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 no. Exponent, powers of two, exponent, two, four, right? One, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 10, 24, 20, 48, 40, 96, eight, one, nine, two, and so on, right? You should memorize that. 
And this is another thing that we want you to memorize, the binary and hexadecimal equivalents. Because if you know those at a minimum, if you know these two columns at a minimum, then you can translate values into decimal, uh, decimal values. And you're gonna probably say, why should I care? Well, understanding what you're looking at on the hardware level is really important. And it's gonna be a skill that you use throughout the course. And I wanna explain that a little further. I want you to understand the relevance, right? I just had you do a writing activity, a short writing activity. And part of your credit for that writing activity was to share something that you read that's interesting, that appeals to you. And you, the first paragraph is you tell what the article's about. And what do you do in the second paragraph? You explain the relevance, right? You explain why others should read or take an interest in your particular article. Well, it just so happens that because computer hardware always speaks ones and zeros, when it manifests to the screen or to papers or to websites where we're using plain English to understand, you know, I'm typing in mycampus.uvi.edu. Each of those characters corresponds to an ASCII table. That ASCII character table in turn is represented by either hexadecimal values or decimal values. It'll say the ASCII code for the letter capital B is, and I'm just pulling something out of thin air, 51, right? So if you look at the, if you look at this and let's, uh, let's just pull up a quick ASCII table, right? So here's an image. Can everybody see this? If I click on this, Let's zoom in on it. Okay. So this character table coincides with values, many of which are principal characters we use to work with our computer systems and our hardware, right? We get numbers and letters on a screen we take for granted, but those translate to, look, hello, hex values and decimal values. I don't want you to worry about octal values. I don't want you running screaming from the room before Labor Day with your hands flailing in the air. Don't, don't worry about octal, okay? Just don't, don't worry about octal. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we're going to be dealing with specifics in the hexadecimal realm frequently. And I want you to understand what that means intuitively and in terms of binary. If you ever see an F for a hex value, you know it's all ones. And that's hugely important when it comes to network and connectivity, digital communications, the, the basic function and uh, initiation of a device when it's powered on, right? So, so Fs represent the end of a memory address range. And why do you care about the end of a memory address range? I don't know. It could be that there are virtual representations of every hardware device on your system. We've seen this before, haven't we? Didn't I show you this before? Did I not show you this before? Yes, you have. Okay. Yes. Okay. And in order for you to understand how most computer systems operate, you not only have to have context with regard to the hardware, the physical hardware, but you also have to understand the context for its virtual representation in memory when software is using it. And that's the function of the operating system, which is a totally different course, but the foundation for what you need to understand to grasp operating system concepts is intuitively bound to your understanding of some binary and hexadecimal values. Everybody see this? So the memory range for this Intel wireless card that I'm using right now would be generalized. If you each check your system, you may find that the memory range may differ because your hardware components differ. But the point is, is that when the operating system loads, it creates a virtual 
implementation of your wireless card that stands between the actual physical wireless card and the applications that use it. And it uses a memory range. And when you're doing troubleshooting, you need to know what echo 04 and then the rest are zeros through echo 0401 FFFF, right? Here's the hardware interrupt. So this is all ones, and each of these letters represents how many bits? Anyone? Each letter represents how many bits? Go look at your table. How many bits are we representing for each hexadecimal value? Hello. Four. Four is correct. Four is correct. Okay. Uh, all right. So I'm going to shift a gear now, but if you haven't committed this to memory and you haven't committed your powers to two to memory and um, the, the relevance is extremely powerful. And as a matter of trust, um, I will promise you that the rest of the course will be easy or easier if if you commit this to memory. Now, let's get back to the worksheet. The worksheet intentionally prompts you. It gives you one type of value, and then it prompts you for the next value you need to manually determine the other value. If I'm going from decimal to hexadecimal, it's helpful for me to go between the decimal and the binary, right? So if I determine the binary value, then I can do a bit shift calculation. I don't even have to do stuff in my head. I just slide the ones and zeros around. So eight times is great. If I'm moving to the left, I'm increasing the value by factors of two. Two, four, eight, 16, 32. Oh, oh, that sounds familiar. 64. Does everybody get what I'm saying here? Hello? Hello? Yeah. 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 Okay. So how many places am I shifting? Two to the first, two to the second, two to the second is four times as great. Two to the third is eight times as great. Damn. So I'm shifting three times to the left because two to the third is eight, right? So what do I do? I get the original value of 170, right? And there's two ways to do this. You can grab your handy dandy calculator and you can just take 170 and punch it in and cheat and fill these things in. But as a matter of principle, I don't want you to do that. What I want you to do instead is I want you to do something like this. All right, so I have a worksheet here. So what's the original value? Well, I'm gonna, I want you to work with this, right? And um, the original binary value, if I had, I can have up to 255 decimal, see the decimal value of eight bits maxes out at 255. So if I have a number that's 255 or less, I can represent that decimal number in binary form with eight bits. 255 is all ones. And how do I get that number? I add one, two, four, eight, 16, if I add all that up, I get 255, right? What's the original value or the first value? Zero, okay? So zero through 255 represents 256 discrete values. Two to the eighth is 256, maybe? Let's see, two to the zero power is one, two to the one power is two, two to the two power is four, three, four, five, six, seven, two to the seventh is 256, right? That's why you need to kind of become very familiar with this. There's an offset of one because we're starting with zero and that can throw students, right? It can throw people. And when they're doing simple calculations with hardware design and it doesn't work, it's like, oh, I'm off, really? I'm off by one, I'm off by one decimal place. I'm off by one binary place, right? 
oh, I'm using the wrong power of two factor. Remember that you're always starting with two to the zero power here, which means we're dealing with one. And then two to the first power, anything to the first power is its own base value. If I have 27 to the first power, that's 27, right? We're not dealing with base 27, thankfully. So how do I get this? If I work backwards, I put a one here, that represents 128. So I've covered 128 of the 170. Is everybody with me? Yes. Yes. This is one way to do it. This is one way to do it. Okay, so I'm gonna take 170 minus 128. That leaves me with 42. Well, 42, this is like long division. You remember long division? Yes. <laughs> if I turn on the 64-bit character, that's too much because I only have 42 left. I can't turn on the 64-bit character right here. I can turn on the 32-bit character. So I can do this. And now I can, that number represents uh, 128 plus 32 is 160, right? Minus 32. So now I have 10 left. Can I turn on the 16 value? If I only have 10 left? No. Nope, I can't, right? So I'm gonna leave that zero, but I can turn on the eight value, which only leaves two left. Well, I know what that is. That's two right here. My question is, is 1010 and 1010 actually 170 in decimal? So I'm gonna check my work. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna change my calculator type to programmer. I'm gonna select binary, I'm going to type in 10101010. And I'm going to look and I'm going to see, oh, yeah, there it is 170. Now I get a preview of coming attractions. But if I go to my table, what's 1010? A. So why am I asking you to work through this sheet, this worksheet, right? Well, I also provided, and I hope I hope you saw it, that what came with it, right? So um, if you're in here and you have the answer key, see, I color coded this stuff, right? So that's what the color coding means. It's shorthand for what I just walked through you with you verbally, okay? So eight times is left three places, okay? How did I get that? Well, if I bit shift to the left once, that's doubled. Bit shift to the left twice, that's quadrupled. Bit shift to the left three times, that's eight, right? Two to the third is eight. So I'm dealing with factors of two. What about one quarter? Well, one half is in the other direction. I'm shifting once to the right, that's one half. Once to the right again, that's one half squared, that's one quarter. If I shift to the right again, that's one half times one half times one half, that'd be one eighth, right? So I can change the value of a thing just by shifting the bits, right? So now that I have the bits, I'm creating four more zeros on the left side and shifting three places to the left. This quantity right here is exactly the same as what I started with, except it's shifted three places to the left. Now I have zero, one, zero, one. Well, what is that on my 0101 zero, one, zero, one is five. It's five. Yeah, it's five. So when I increase that value by a factor of eight, I'm shifting left to the three three spaces, and, and that and that first value for the hexadecimal number is five, right? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check my work here. And I, okay, the second value is zero one zero one. That's the same thing, right? And then I and then I have zeros. I got to keep the the place. The hexadecimal value of five five zero is actually a decimal value of one thousand three hundred and sixty. Well, how do we check that? 
I don't know. Uh, let's take the decimal value of 170 and multiply it by eight. Bingo, 1360. What's the hex value? 550. Well, how did I come up with that? Or more importantly, and this is really the point, how does your computer do some of its bit level operations? Right? Now, if you start to think in binary terms and you start to understand this, the sky's the limits. I've said before, you can work for Intel, AMD, NVIDIA. You can name your price, six figure salaries. That kind of stuff happens every day. I know people who work at Intel and I watch them as they progressed through their different academic levels. So this stuff is the real deal. Now, that's solution number one, okay? Given your answer sheet, now you understand what the rest of these highlighted pieces of information are and why they're significant, right? Are there any questions about what you're doing for this worksheet? And does anyone want me to cover Does anyone want me to cover, see, I know 1010 is A. I don't even have to think about it. Once I know this table, I can just look at a binary value and go, oh, that's AA. And see, here's what's gonna happen, right? You're gonna have a job interview or you're gonna be working in low level programming challenges, right? Like bit level operations in C++ or something. And they're gonna go, how do you know this? And you're like, well, computer architecture, right? Um, does anyone care to review one of the items on the worksheet directly in class? Now I walk through, I walk through three of these stepwise with, with a series of guided questions. And that was to get you started on the process. Okay. What's the common link for all of them? You're usually given a value in either decimal or hexadecimal and you're trying to translate. Sometimes you're given a binary value and you're asked to change the binary value to decimal. Either way, it's the, it's the binary value that's the stepping stone. When you're doing conversion operations manually, you need to always derive the binary value. And if you're given the binary value, you can work pretty quickly in the other direction, okay? So 255 is the decimal value provided for a scenario that requires a 64 fold increase. Oh my gosh. Well, what power of two is 64? If I slide to the left once it's doubled, then quadrupled, then octupled. So eight is three slides. Eight. Yeah, exactly. Well, 16 is, four slides, 32 is five slides, 64 is six slides. You're sliding to the left six times. Eight times would be 256 larger. So an entire eight bit slide, uh, if you slid eight bits, that's the same, that's the equivalent of increasing 256 times, okay? That's why it, it pays to get familiar. Now, when you have this question, I'm not guiding you with those questions, right? By this time, when you finish the first three examples, I'm showing you the process that you use to derive these things manually. And then, all right, when you're given a binary value of 0011, what's the hex value of this when it's quadrupled? Well, I'm going from binary to hex. Do I have to worry about going to decimal in the between? Can I work from binary to hex directly? Yeah. Do you have to translate into decimal first or can I go straight from binary to hex if I need to with this table? You can go straight from binary to hex. You can go straight from binary to hex. If I'm quadrupling, how many, how many places am I sliding to the left? Four. Two is correct. So these two values end up where? Yeah. 
to the left. To the left, right here. So my new number is one, one, zero, zero. So I've taken the two ones and I've slid them one, two places to the left and I've gained two trailing zeros. What's one, one, zero, zero? I haven't broken a, a nibble boundary. I haven't broken a D word boundary. So sometimes the nibble is called a D word. So I look in here, what's one, one, zero, zero? Uh, that's Charlie right there. And the decimal value is 12. Well, does that make sense? Let's look at the worksheet again. This is one and this is two. I'm looking at the binary equivalent of what decimal number? Or hexadecimal number? Three. Three is correct. When I quadruple three, what's my answer? Three times four is? Twelve. Twelve. Well, that's this number in, in binary or in hex, C, right? Everybody see that? Yeah. yeah. Right. This is the stuff you have to be able to do for the assessment. Now, you can go into pro programmer mode on your calculator. And here's the thing. If you go ahead and you click into each and you just punch in the numbers and then you just read the stuff back, I can train certain highly intelligent species of animals to do a couple of basic operations. The goal of this module is not to train you to do the quick and easy that any any individual could do. The purpose of this module is to get you to see the deeper process. And in order to appreciate the deeper process, I, I, I urge you, I beg you to take the time to do the manual process, at least so much as you memorize this at a minimum and you understand bit shifts left and right, okay? And uh, yeah, all right, you get the point. Any questions about our worksheet? Would anyone care for me to walk through any of the items? Or are we, are we pretty good in terms of the explanation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to be able to finish the rest of it on my own. Very good. I would urge you to try it on your own and check your answers with the answer key before you take the assessment. There's a number of assessment items that are going to be on the assessment that have to do with these conversions. And you can always use your calculator to check your work. But it's kind of like Okay, I can, um, in boot camp, I can do the exercises or I can watch a video of someone else doing the exercises. There is no benefit to your muscle mass in terms of your cranium. You don't gain any cognitive capacity if, if you don't, don't work that. So this is kind of on the honor system. Now, why am I telling you this up front intentionally and deliberately? And I want you to think about this. The students who do this worksheet manually and commit a little bit of time and effort to do this, they do much better on the midterm and the final. They do much better on the assessment. Those who don't, don't do as well on the assessment, but in particular, they don't do as well on the midterm and final. Why should you care? A third of your grade is hands-on. A third of your grade are assessments. A third of your grade are final exams and midterm exams, okay? The exams cannot be repeated. You don't get to resubmit or redo exams. There is no reconciliation for errors for exams, okay? Does everybody understand that? You don't get a second shot at a midterm. You don't get a second shot at a final. The midterm exams exist so that I know if you're actually picking up the skills and learning. The assessments for each module 
are for you so that you know you're picking up the skills and you're learning. Hackers are very good at working around and taking the easy way out. I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you, do not take the easy way out. Or later in the course, it's gonna show. And I'm gonna be tapping you on the shoulder and going, uh, yeah, you woulda, coulda, shoulda, huh? Okay, well, never too late. It's just a lot easier to do this up front. And it's kind of like learning your multiplication tables. And that's, that's not always sexy, right? It's not always popular, not always easy, can be a little boring depending on how, how rich the environment around you is filled with distractions. This is, this is one of those things where it, it takes a little bit of quality time and you really ought to push back the rest of the world when you're doing this worksheet and then check and then check your answer sheet, then use the calculator, but walk through the process just as I did. Okay. Now, as far as the assess, any, any questions about the worksheet and the intent of the worksheet and where we are? Okay. Now, it goes without saying that everything on the study guide, you need to know backwards, forwards, and inside out. Okay. If it's in here, you got to know it. I'm going to ask you questions that have to do with the solution. So I might show like an error message. Uh, if you don't have the Java, it'll say something about Java W not found, right? So um, there are a few assessment items that have to do with the HDL simulator, right? So a few assessment items that have to do with bit shifts, a few that have to do with conversions. You can convert neatly and cleanly when you're doubling, when you're doing a factor of two. When you're not doing a factor of two, you're performing different operations to get those results, right? I'm gonna to try to trick you when it comes to the difference between and and or, and how and does not mean sum, okay? I'm telling you this up front, all right? I will also show you pictures of logic gates based on what's in the, textbook for those sections. And we've already been through that, right? So what do you do when you make a mistake on the assessment? You're, you're going to have an opportunity um, to review each question. So when we configure the assessment, you're going to be able to see your score you will not be able to see your score until everyone else has finished. What am I saying? There's a window. I'm gonna post your assessment at the top of the module. So if you click into the module where you see the other assignments and solution, at the very top, you'll see assessment. I am not, contrary to previous practice, I am not extending the deadline for your first attempt. Now I used to do that, but I got scolded by some students in the last year, in the last academic year. And one of their constructive criticisms was, well, it takes too long for the professor to get the graded materials back. Ladies and gentlemen, would you care to guess why it took me longer to get some of the graded stuff back to students? Because students weren't turning it in. Say again? The students were like not turning it in, so you had to keep extending it? Yes, some of the students weren't turning it in. And it's almost like each student in the class took their own, like, it's like they were almost taking turns. These are small classes, right? It's like, hey, can I have some more time? Can I have some, okay, well, at first in the early part of the semester, that's not a problem. But what happens with assessments? Well, if I push back the deadline for the assessment and it's the first attempt, everybody gets to correct their errors anyway, right? And if I set the switch so that everybody sees their results immediately upon completing the assessment, but I have a three-day window, what's the other thing students tend to do? I'll tell you, post that crap on Course Hero post the answers online. And I've caught students doing that. And I've tapped them on the shoulder and said, do you wanna be the poster child 
for how not to uh, mess around in my class, because what do I teach mostly? Cyber and hacking. If you try technology workarounds, I'm the guy that's going to catch you. Okay, so I'm just being I'm just being transparent, totally transparent right now. Okay. Now, if I have a heart early in the semester, now why do I wait until everybody's finished? Because studies have shown if you grade things or score them and return them and you do it in batches, the instructor's consistency is very much diminished, right? The outcomes are very much diminished. Now, these are automatically graded, so it's not as critical with assessments. But what we want to do is get the reconciliation in front of students so they can look at the gaps in understanding, they can make their quick corrections, and then they can nail it. They can take it across the finish line and this time hit it out of the ballpark, okay? In order to work more efficiently and effectively, I want to, in the hearing of my voice for those from last semester who had me, if you're watching this in YouTube and you tuned into this, uh, this season, um, I have heard your constructive criticism and I have made adjustments in my course so that people get their grades back sooner. And um, I'm, but I'm trying to do it in a way where it's fair and it's upfront and we're open about it to everybody, okay? Because I've been here a number of years and uh, students tend to compare notes and share with each other about how a certain professor is. And when I change a significant part of my modus operandi, I want to be intentional and upfront about it so people aren't caught in the lurch. It's like, oh, I heard this is what you allow students to do. And I'm like, yeah, not anymore. Not, not this one aspect anyway. And I don't think that's going to be a terrible inconvenience for students. I, I think what you'll come to value is that you, it's really good that you can reconcile uh, gaps in understanding or mistakes. Are there any questions? Oh, now the assessment will include true, false, multiple choice and multiple answer. One last word, multiple answer. Do not select all the answers if you're not sure. If an answer is wrong and it shouldn't be selected, you will lose points by choosing. And if, you, if you're like, okay, well, it could be any of these, so I'm just gonna select them all. You'll lose your shirt. You'll actually go in the hole. I've seen negative scores, okay? So a multiple answer is, Select any of these that apply, right? And if they don't apply, don't. If you have any doubts, don't select it. Any questions about multi answer? No. Okay. No. All right. Well, um, I hope you have a safe and pleasant Labor Day weekend. We're going to close right now because we certainly don't want to go over. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing, stop recording.